Hi, everybody. Uh, today is April 19th, where I am, and April 20th, where uh, my guest Sanjeev Sablok is. And he's an amazing man. Um, I've only known him very briefly. I'm in his debt because I was in space today and I got things a little bit started late. So uh, I'm very much honored. Tell us a little bit of what, what uh, your background is, uh, what your tasks have been, and what has interested you um, emotionally, uh, philosophically, economically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, that's an amazing uh, introduction and, uh, you know, an open-ended question. One can go on forever. No, but basically, um, we are talking because uh, I've had a very significant, uh, you know, problem with public health over the past three years. And uh, public health has not behaved the way I would expect it to behave. So my history is that of a civil servant in India, a senior civil servant uh, in the Indian Administrative Service, which is the premier civil service of India. And then I resigned because I was sick of the corruption there and I wanted to fix it. So I started a political party for India, etc. cetera. Uh, then I've been working in Australia for as an economist for over 15 years. And then I resigned here as well once I realized that I'm being bullied by my chief health officer, you know, in Victoria. So this guy is telling me to wear a mask outdoors. And I sent him a video on Twitter saying... Uh, Look at this. Where the hell is the virus? How can it possibly enter my my nose when it's not there? So please, you know, give me the logic behind it. He wouldn't respond, and he blocked me. Uh, in the meanwhile, the the premier, the the they call him premier, the chief minister of the state here, Dan Andrews, uh, started getting uh, the police to beat up little young girls and choke them because they were not wearing a mask outdoors. And uh, to me, that became like 1984. I said, this is getting really bad. Uh, I'm working in the government. Uh, I, 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 I'm writing a lot of articles in Times of India about the whole situation, you know, basically telling the country in India, because that's where my focus was on India, right? Now, these guys are now forcing me to do something about it. And so I'm, I said it's 1984, etc. Then this uh, department, my bosses uh, and others, you know, must have found out uh, that this guy is raising a lot of ruckus on Twitter. Not a lot of ruckus. I started criticizing this whole thing on uh, I was criticizing the Indian policies first of all mm -hmm. okay? but then I didn't criticize the state government here but then I started criticizing the state government they asked me to remove things and I resigned on the spot so that's my second resignation uh, but this time well, because well, of public I want to stop for a second just like hmm. bravo I mean that, that you, that's a man of principle that's a tough tough thing to do uh, look uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm sort of you know I'm a bit of a bull I, I bull in the china shop i just mm -hmm. want the things to be done right otherwise i don't participate in that process something of the sort that we discussed with you earlier uh it doesn't work for me as a human being i don't live uh, two lives i don't care for other people's opinion about me and so on stuff there's a lot of history there but mm -hmm. this is uh, this is not the only time i've done this kind of thing i've done a lot i've taken a lot of stands in my life and i continue to fight criminals and i once i've decided these guys are criminals i wrote also a complaint to the international criminal court against the uh, premier a long hundred and something 50 page complaint providing all the details what the you know laws principles etc that they violated with the lockdowns and all these other things which are not based on any evidence and and at the same time we had this guy anders tegnell who, uh, with whom i've been in touch briefly by the way and he did respond uh, to one of my uh, emails uh, where i shared an article that i had written uh, about sweden in the australian the newspaper the you know main newspaper of australia and he responded and he said thanks and so on so but but you know the fact that tegnell is giving a master class on public health mm -hmm. at the same time we have these characters not responding to even the basic questions you know the first thing is consultation transparency tell us about why you're doing what you're doing right i agree so and and, and that's why you know we are talking because i've been I resigned three years ago, more than three years ago now, and um, oh, not actually, two, uh, it's two and a half years ago, sorry, what am I saying? I've lost my numbers. Uh, no, two and a half years ago, I resigned and, uh, uh, you know, just fighting the whole thing and writing and doing this and, and that. So uh, on, a, on a personal basis, how, how are you supporting yourself? And what, what are things like at home for you, like literally your home, your house, your friends, your family? Um, how, how has your status changed, emo you know, emotionally, socially? Well, uh, I'm surviving because we, uh, you know, both my wife and I work, and so she's still working as a social worker now. Uh, she's, by the way, a senior civil servant as well uh, from India, my same batch, but she works as a social worker now because of, you know, various issues. Let's not go there. But the thing is, uh, we're surviving somehow. And uh, yeah, I, I planned to get back to some work, and I've been trying it, but no one's hiring me. Uh, that's what I've realized in the last few months. I think my reputation here in Australia 
as an economist who speaks his mind is not welcomed by anybody. Um, mm. Look, that's okay. I, I think uh, to survive doesn't take too much. Too much. And my friends and family, uh, well, uh, some friends were obviously disenfriended, un unfriended, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, during this process uh, because they they thought that I'm talking nonsense and I thought that they're doing that. And so we didn't have any match. But otherwise, I'm not a very social person. I'm uh, into my books all the time. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's like 2% for social, you know, activity, 98% right. on my own. I, I live my own life. So I, I'm not been much affected. So what, what's been your compass? How, how do you know that things are wrong? You know, when you say, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that, you know, you don't need a mask outdoors. You never did. I don't think you needed one indoors. You know, the masks, if they were scuba, scuba gear um, and you had an external air source like they do in the, the actual Wuhan lab, so forth, you see they're, they're in those kind of space mm. suits, hat, like, you know, and you're, okay, fine. You know, if you were in a bathysphere, that kind of thing, those masks might work. But but to, to think that you could put a mask on, let's say you did go scuba diving with a mm. with a an N95 or a, a surgical <laughs> cloth mask. I mean, mm. you know, are you going to be able to like breathe in and out? No. I mean, they're porous. And, and if water molecules can get through, you know, basically everything else can. This whole concept. I mean, I saw a video early on in COVID. You know, somebody smoked a cigarette, took a breath, put the mask on. You know, and then he, he breathes with it. And and you see the smoke like going out the edges or whatever and 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 you know through the thing. I mean, you're obviously you're breathing. The air is getting in somehow, and a lot of it's not going through, you know, oh, I, I'm the air. I, I'm we're just gonna go through the porous part of you know the, of your mask. We're not gonna go around mm -hmm. the open edges and so forth. Mm. But it, but even so, even if you wear one tightly fitted, it's still obviously, you know, the, the virions themselves are I think 50 microns. And and the, the 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 holes, you know, if you magnify it, are it's like putting a golf ball through a doorway. I mean, <laughs> I mean you know, I, yes. I, I imagine you can slow them down a little bit, and they're probably good, pro, pro, you know, on sneezing. I mean, medically, we always wore masks so we don't sneeze onto the surgical field. But but as far as inhalation, I mean, you know, people have just, you know, they 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 fantasize a little bit about these things. And they feel better, and it becomes a messaging tool. I think more than yeah. anything else, it's become a um, kind of a uh, psychological you know, we, psychological safety yeah, kind well, of thing. Well, yeah. Plus, people can f find the in group and the out group, the people they want to like, and so forth. So it's uh, I don't know if you ever know Dr. Seuss, uh, Theodore Geisel, the, the, the children's writer, but he had mm. a, a story that the the Sneeches, and they spend all their time trying to get a signifier. Um, so they can tell each other the, the group they like, their in group and their out group. Anyway, I apologize for that that uh, <laughs> that diversion. So, what what is the work you're actually been working on, and 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 where is it going? Who is your audience? Uh, what type of feedback uh, have you got? Yeah, it's a good question because I actually have a book. So, uh, so you know, I've been doing a lot. I've I've written about a few, maybe maybe close to a hundred articles and blog posts and so on. Articles in Times of India blog. So that's where I write and. Uh, and then I've got, uh, you know, a book that I wrote after resigning. I don't know whether you can see it. It's upside yep. down, I suppose. It's yep. uh, The Great Hysteria and the Broken State. Uh, that was published in uh, October 2020. Then I worked with Gigi Foster on this book, which is the cost-benefit analysis of Australia's lockdowns. Oh, wonderful. P hold that up a little bit longer. I want to, everyone to yeah. kind of go go purchase this. I mean, there you go. All right. Yeah, that's better. Okay. So I don't know whether it can, seems to be upside yeah, I'll, down. I'll put, it, I'll put it up in the, in the back screen a little bit. Yeah, I think yeah. I don't know what happened, but anyway, okay. look. The the thing is, uh, so I've written these two books, and uh, then of course many articles and so on, and uh, endless number of interviews on television and this and that. And so, by the way, the main channels also interviewed me, etc. A lot of things happened, uh, and, and I've contested elections also. I've asked, I've contested the federal seat, uh, I've contested the local seat of uh, you know my Victorian state uh, parliament, in order to, basically to to educate the community. And of course, that didn't work. But that's not that's a different point. That, that, so I've done a lot of these things, and now I've decided that public health has no real business to exist. Hmm. Uh, in my view, uh, uh, much of the stuff that they do, like you know, water, uh, clean water, and uh, sewage, etc., can be done by engineers, as it was when it started. This whole thing was started by engineers rather than so-called doctors. Uh, we don't need many doctors to go and you know check whether the uh, you know there's a bacteria in the water and so on. So that's so. So clean water and sanitation, et cetera, is not their function. Uh, it's not public health. Uh, it, the, the infectious disease part, yes, I can understand a quarantine is required. And so my I went back to history and there was a thing called medical police. And so it's a police function. You know, no matter where you look at it in public health literature, it says it's a police power. 
the courts also tell them it's a police power. Uh, uh, what's a police power? Let's get back to the basics because I've been trained in the police, right? I, I was the supervisor of the police in India uh, in my district. I, I was the uh, head of the district and the uh, police reported to me. And so but the police power is the power for order and uh, law and order, uh, maintaining order and discipline in society. Public health is not about law and order, but it says that the power it has got is basically a police power. Well, in that case, I'm asking the question, why the hell are you doing it in the first place? Why do we need doctors to do a, a quarantine? A quarantine is therefore best done by the police. As it was in the past, there was a medical police. I have looked at the literature. And so we, 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 we separate that quarantine function, which is really important. And for the other things uh, like Vaccines. Vaccines are not a public health function. I refuse to accept the idea that somebody, you know, you're poking somebody with a with a with a with a vaccine. Uh, that should be a public health function. The the the, the more you look at, and I've looked at uh, Donald Henderson's work, you do not need to vaccinate the whole world, even to eradicate smallpox. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that till I finally started reading his work and actually listening to his uh, talks on the on the YouTube. So when we realize that this basically is. Is, is about a very targeted approach. You know, you target the area, uh, even for smallpox, you know, you find out where the things are, you target the thing, you do a bit of contact tracing, and you you ask those people to vaccinate. And that's about it. The rest of the society doesn't have to. So that's for a thing that can be eradicated. For other things, you really cannot eradicate them. And for things which you cannot eradicate, I do not see this as a public health function at all. Unfortunately, in economics, there's been a lot of casual and poor thinking and so they have justified vaccine mandates. And there's a lot of literature. Even Jay Bhattacharya's book, I'm sorry to say, justifies vaccine mandates through a very shoddy piece of economic thinking. And I don't think that's the right way to go. You have to really say that if it cannot be eradicated, then it is the part of nature. And therefore, it is not your business to have the so-called externality. To prevent others is not a good excuse to mm -hmm. force the vaccine on anybody, particularly if you cannot eradicate. And even if you can eradicate the thing I'm arguing, the, the science is very clear. Even Donald Henderson says you do not need to uh, vaccinate everybody. So I'm looking at this very fundamental questions. You know, what is public health? What does it do? And why does it do it? Who are the defenders? What are the arguments, uh, you know, in its favor? So that's the kind of thing I'm doing. Uh, it'll take me about at least two years of work. This is going to be a very big piece of work. I'm expecting yeah. at least a couple of million words. Oh, so one million, if not two million words. That's going to be like, you know, volumes and volumes of material. Uh, it's going to be basically a collection of uh, evidence from different sources, like including your book and so on. So, you know, so I'm going to prove the point un, un, uh, unequivocally that these things cannot be part of public health. So if vaccines are not part of public health, the uh, water and sanitation is not part of public health, the quarantine is not part of public health, then what is public health? There's nothing in public health. So the public health concept doesn't exist in my mind. And I've written about that in the Mises Institute and... Uh, uh, from there on, I've been working. So I wrote the article in December. I came to this view only in December. Actually, I've been thinking a lot about this. I never thought about asking. I've been asking why lockdowns, why masks, why this. But I didn't ask why public health. Because all we, we all have a very good feeling about public health. It sounds really nice, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's like social justice and good things like that. And so unfortunately, <laughs> they can be very deceptive, these terms. And then I come to the thing like ethics. You must have read about ethics. And, you know, everybody's talking about ethics in public health. And I'm saying I've done public policy all my life. I'm a specialist in public policy. That's exactly what I was paid for and decent money by the government of Victoria. And I've never heard of anybody justify anything through ethics. So what is ethics? And ethics is, sounds like theology. And I was like questioning, questioning, you know, I said, OK, you're good guys. You know, you're very ethical people, etc. You write about ethics. And then I found that they all breach all the ethics anyway. Uh, and the other part is the ethics can mean anything to anybody. And then I find Hitler is very ethical. He thinks he's very ethical. The Catholics, uh, he found a Catholic priest who justified his thing with a 100-page document. That's ethical. So, look, ethics is not the way we look at the world. We cannot mm -hmm. define public policy through ethics. Ethics is a very subjective term, uh, very personal. We need objective criteria. And, and that's exactly what we do as economists. We look at cost, benefit, etc. So... There is no uh, tradition of cost benefit in the public health literature. They, they very rarely talk about it and they never do it in any case. So the last large number of cost benefit analysis, for example, this one, uh, 
a 200 page document which is actually a, <clears throat> a summary of what i started writing about the, this you know we had written about 300 words and the publisher wanted to cut it down but, but the point is that's the kind of detailed analysis that public health never does mm. so public health is doing public policy without doing even the cost benefit analysis and talking uh, ethics and so on so you know, it, it fails on every single thing that I've looked at. <laughs> so I'm saying your epidemiological models are crap. Your uh, your logic is, your, uh, they don't understand Donald uh, Henderson's uh, logic of why border closures cannot work. It's a simple thing that even a two, you know, five-year-old child can understand uh, that when you're passing through the border, even with smallpox, you don't, you're not, so the first thing is your self-selection uh, uh, operates, you know, only those who are not symptomatic will go in travel because if you are symptomatic, you cannot travel. So you have ruled out all the symptomatic people in the first place. Now you've got people with smallpox. They're going to the border. They don't know that they've got smallpox, that they're carrying smallpox, or they might be just slightly starting to show symptoms and you cannot, they don't know and you can't know. And now they've gone to the border. And so Henderson found that with all the cases that he identified, and uh, in fact, Professor um, Mack, I think he worked with him. Uh, he's, the, he's the still alive in the Uni uh, University of Southern California. He confirmed that this is the article, uh, the study of Europe. So there were two articles published by one by Henderson, one by Mack, uh, uh, prov uh, proving that you cannot identify even the smallpox cases at the border because they do not show symptoms. So then they enter the country. And then they spread. Each of them spread to about 25 people. And then they did the, you know, uh, the, the, the verifications. So you found that practically nobody can be identified at the bottom. Uh, there were a couple of cases. Right. Well, what if you what if you close just to play devil's advocate? What if you, yeah. you know, close the border completely? So you became an let's say you were not you literally yeah, were an yeah. island. Yeah. You know, yeah, so you a... you close you know I don't know you're the island of Tahiti <laughs> and, and you actually... stop all boats. You mean you know I mean the Faroe Islands had an interesting. Um, episode during coronavirus and they kept an open society and they but they didn't have much traffic in and out they they dealt with covid they without lockdowns without closing schools a little bit like sweden and but more so because they're very close small society and they need each other they decided they made this equation that um they wanted social contact more than they they, they feared isolation and the, the problems from isolation more than they feared uh, uh you know basically a, an influenza type bug without a vaccine but let's say you, just for devil's advocate, I mean, what if you just close the border completely and you could have a completely, you know, isolated, like literally, literally an island is the same word as I, I sola means island in Latin. Um, what, what, what would that be like? Is that is that reasonable prop proposition? <laughs> I mean, look, everything is reasonable if you and when then you look at the analysis and I've done this in my latest article in terms of India, I've actually asked this question and I've addressed that question. So, yes, of course you can. So I've said, yes, if you close the border. Yes, you can shut down, shut down a virus. But remember, it has to be a perfect closure. You cannot have right. something like North Korea where, you know, some flights come in and go out and so on. A hundred percent closure, not even like North Korea, but much more severe. Right, because, one. right. I, I get that. Yeah. But number like, two, but number two, there's something more interesting going on here. That unless the virus is eradicated from the planet, till that time, you cannot open your borders anymore. So right. the only thing that has been eradicated is smallpox. And the only thing that is eradicable, according to Donald Henderson, he looked at all the things before he died. And he said, no, that's the only thing I can think of that can possibly get eradicated. Nothing else fits that criteria. Criteria. So if you are happy to be permanently till, of, you know, whatever, a few million years at least, or, or maybe a billion years, shut down your borders permanently, that's fair enough. Yes, you can. Yeah. In the process, you become pretty much like what happened to the, you know, uh, the the local populations of of uh, previous uh, of old, you know, old America or whatever you call it. People who got infected when the new people came in, right? So you, they are the ones who died in vast numbers, even right? In, because they, in they've lost all basic immunity. No, immunity. I, I think you're making a reasonable point. There is a, <laughs> um, uh, is it there's kind of a dynamic tension. A symb it's not quite symbiosis. It means something different, but um, basically, you know, you're population is never going to be 100% living 100% of the time for, you know, forever. Now, I'm just going to make a si quick sidelight. You know, I'm getting a little bit gray on the sides here. Um, you know, people what about <laughs> don't, don't necessarily know why you get gray. And I hope this, I'm trying to make this really short, but animals, other animals gray. Like if you look at a herd of deer, uh, some of them are graying on the sides. And apparently this is essentially, it's almost economic. It's essentially a tax given to the predators. So if you're a, a grazing animal like deer, 
um, you know, let's say there's 100 in your herd. Uh, if you could make an economic choice, a preference choice, say, OK, I, we understand there are lions and tigers or whatever panthers out there. We're going to lose a couple of members of our herd, herd every year. Whom would they whom would we least likely be eaten? Well, we don't want the kids eaten. Right. That That's horrible. Now, we don't want the fertile gals and so forth. The, the, the guys that can take care of themselves are the strongest men. So we don't want our teenagers to be eaten. We don't want our kids to be eaten. And and the women, fertile women, and so forth. But but you know we we know the the panthers, the tiger, they're going to get some of us. So what you know we're going to do biologically? I mean this is not thought out. We're going to start graying, and this is going to be an easy sign for predators. That one, <laughs> if you can get one of us, that it's going to be one. it's basically an, an agreement between the predators and the prey. Like we don't want you to eat us, okay? We we're going to run. But if you if you are running, you're going to see that one. That one's probably a little bit slower. It's going to be an easier time for you. And that's the one we're going to lose. That's the tax for being a herd. And and speaking of tax and at tax, you know, so so the lines and you know, I, I'm sure it's not tacit. I'm sure they don't have a compact. But basically, they are understanding they're not living forever. They're not eternal beings. And this is kind of a, a tax. Now, to, to to kind of transmute this to the you know virus argument, you know, we had a situation where even early on in January 2020, the Diamond Princess was a perfect experiment. It was a boat quarantine almost literally you know for 40 days the, the italian means quarante 40 days and and sitting off the coast of japan and coronavirus circulated i mean it's the ventilation system on a cruise ship is perfect for this and and some people got sick some people got, at the end of the day the end of the months you know 10 out of 3711 people died the median age was 82 this duplicated all over all over earth nobody talked about this at the time although it was known dr fauci if you go go on twitter you you know or whatever you you can find him quoting the diamond princess in february 2016 he knew about it they were watching it they were watching it, but then they never said another word about it so so the the tax was un, unfortunately i mean i love my elderly i'm i'm planning on being elderly you know i'm hoping i don't get sacrificed and get eaten by tigers but but if if a tiger did come and it was a choice of me and my you know hopefully future grandchildren or you know the neighborhood kids i want me eaten. i don't want them eaten. you know mothers will 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 dive in front of a car to protect their children you know th this is a, a normal thing of all animals you you save your young and what we did here was essentially criminal by by sacrificing our young to protect our old now again I, i'm not saying we shouldn't protect our old but in, you're mentioning J jay bhattacharya you know, he, he mentioned focus protection, which I think was a, a politically palatable solution, not necessarily the perfect one, because I think it, it, it ignored the fact that the, you know, the other ones didn't necessarily need that much protection at all. You know, so and, and, and this is kind of come full circle on the analogy. The bulwark is to have some virus circulating through because you get stronger and you get natural immunity is always stronger. If you look at Wikipedia and you go to the archive 2018, it's natural immunity. If you go look at the web wikipedia in 2021 it's viral they say herd immunity is from vaccine they, they changed wikipedia they're changed nice speak you mentioned george orwell's uh, 1984 mm -hmm. this is where they 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 change the past in the future and and there's this old soviet joke it's like i don't know what history is today i'm gonna wait till tomorrow you know it, it, you, you, it, it changes all the time and they mm. do it for an expedience and that, this is I, I i'm kind of I, be, I think i believe in public health i'm not ready, ready, to, ready to jump on your bandwagon completely but i do think it's been polluted by um you know certain things regulatory capture um and and, and big pharma and big public health kind of joining together and and people are unaware of how much uh, uh, the nih and so forth is supported by big pharma um contributions and then you know when 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 the Tom Frieden leaves or whatever, he gets supported by the foundations that that you know are putting money into the the public health, and the public health does that. It's a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, and a little bit like the Panthers and the and the, and the deer, perhaps. It's, not, it's a compact of sort, where you know they are bending over wrongly. I would say backwards, whatever, forwards. They're bending over one way or another wrongly to pharmaceutical interests, and and the vaccines have turned out to be very lucrative. And I'm going to leave it there. Um, so that that wasn't really a question. I apologize. That was a diatribe. Uh, no, it's a, it's a pretty uh, you know you've covered a wide range of issues. So, so I think the uh, we started with the fact that can lockdowns actually work? And uh, no, they can't. Uh, uh, they can only cause harm. Uh, the other main point that Paul Fridges had mentioned in your interview, which is really the one I picked up as probably the biggest point in the science of uh, public health since uh, mankind's inception. Even Donald Henderson didn't have that point, which Paul had which I've you know, been really appreciative of. 
that he says you cannot have a total lockdown in the first place. He disproves the idea of a lockdown. Just like you said, masks cannot exist. They have to be leaky masks. Likewise, lockdowns cannot exist. So the idea of lockdowns is impossible. The idea of border closures is impossible. The idea of so these are impossible things. Uh, the other point that you mentioned is uh, uh, the regulatory capture, and and so look, that's exactly why uh, vaccines are to be treated like a normal drugs. You know, when you think about economists, we actually have a very strong history of opposing uh, things like occupational lic licensing of doctors. You know, the fact that there's a board that can license you and therefore dismiss you or whatever challenge you. That is that is a direct breach of all things that economists have been saying from the time of Adam Smith. Mm -hmm. So you know, the fact that nobody listens to economists is there is at their peril. Okay, because the reason why doctors want the um, uh, this particular you know occupational licensing is because they benefit. So the right. vast number of them benefit. It's like regular capture. They yeah, become it's a, the, rent, it's a rent seeking proposition. It's a rent seeking proposition because there is no logical reason on earth to have occupational licensing of anything, of anybody, including doctors. But that's just one part of the story of health. And then you have Milton Friedman write about the FDA. He studied it extensively and he said that's a completely big racket and it cannot be otherwise. So what yeah. we're saying is what you're seeing in public health to me is not something which is a, which is a, you know, a remarkable event like your Zika you know, a study. That's basically been replicated thousands of times. Uh, public health does exactly the same thing every time. You can always predict that the most corrupt in an organization will rise to the top in public health. Uh, uh, these are these are way. By the way, economics economics economists are very cynical, right? We 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 assume that people are opportunists. If you go to the textbook of economics, I've got so many of them. The first chapter or the first page will say. The assumption of human beings is that they are as opportunists. Okay, so now uh, what's an opportunist? We can study that separately. It's not an ethical person. Let me tell you that. Okay, the first thing is humans are not ethical, and that is a fundamental mistake made by any socialist person who thinks that you know ethics is good. It's not. You have to assume economists. Economists have a t tendency to be realists. We always look at the real world. We do not imagine theoretical, speculative worlds. Okay, this is the real world. These are real human beings. This is how they behave. And so my predictions are that there will be regulatory capture. It's not my prediction, sorry. It's uh, Milton Friedman as well, before him as well. Right. So occupational licensing is dangerous. The idea of uh, having a government to assess a drug's suitability is dangerous. So we don't want FDA at all. Forget about your regulatory capture. Uh, you know, so the eco what economists will tell you is a lot of these functions, like in London, the water supply is completely private, the private sector. It was the, the very fact, if you go back to history, is that the sanitation, sorry, the filtration idea, the clean water was not invented by anybody in the government, was a complete private sector enterprise ex exercise in London. And it was then copied by some of the places in, in Europe. But the point is that private sector is more than capable of cleaning our water, supplying and, and, and you know, getting rid of uh, sewage. So I don't see the... This is not a public good. When we say, sorry, it is a public good. Hold on. Let me just not say. It's a public good, but like I keep teaching when I teach in economics, public goods are not necessarily supplied by the government. They can be supplied right. by the private sector. I think you're making an excellent point. I, I was in Japan four or five years ago. And uh, so they, they they love their trains. Uh, and, if, you know, tra driving is t tough. You know, tight roads, very concentrated place. And the train, okay, fine. There, there's obviously aspects of it right of way, um, and you know certain train lines, and then sharing a train through private companies. I mean, I, I think they have a, a national train company, but at the very least, they they subbed out uh, the, the 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 real estate rights for their train stations. And so this has created. I tell you, they were the you know they were eye opening. They're remarkable, beautiful places. The train stations here. You go to train stations, bus stations in the United States, like you do not want to hang around those places. They're very poorly run. They have the, the tragedy of the commons. Uh, nobody's really watching it. You know, you have uh, what we call homeless or uh, whatever people kind of panhandling and hanging out and all those kinds of stuff. In Japan, the, the, the train stations are the, the center of, of, of the smaller towns and smaller cities and whatnot. And they're, they're beautiful. They're malls and whatnot. It's just clean. And, 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 you know, if you go to the public restroom, it's a totally different experience because they are managed uh, privately and they are, are are there for expense. And so I think you're making a reasonable point, you know, that, that <laughs> you know, what the United States Constitution uh, became a successful template because it understood that humans are fallen and that we need 
you know, checks and balances. We need to keep away from each other and we need a, a, pl a way and a, a place that people can be held accountable and they can also compete uh, and have the best ideas come up. So you don't want one group totally in control. And I, I, I'm going to carry on with this thought. I apologize. But, you know, the, 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 the dark cloud inside the silver lining inside the dark cloud of, of coronavirus for me was that this is, and again, change metaphor, was a little bit like canary in a coal mine. What we saw was the parliamentary system, which we always thought was democracy, uh, has, has a huge fault line um, in this situation. So our, you know, the U.S. allies are, you know, the Anglospheres like Canada, Australia, um, you know, the U.K., um, uh, New Zealand, and whatnot. Um, th those places went through horrible times, and they, they wound up with a tyranny of the majority. And so they have a parliamentary system, which is kind of, you know, black and white. It's just kind of one thing or the other. So you have total power and everything centralized. The UK does not have an actual constitution. They have this written or excuse me, unwritten constitution, which uh, I don't know what that is. You know, it's, it's basically common law. And this is kind of the way we do things. However, you can start doing things differently. And nobody, there's no checks and balance, no Supreme Court to, to intercede. Um, you know, the, 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 the president, the, the, you know, the prime minister is, is elected by their house of representatives uh you know obviously the house of commons they call it. but so they basically have you know a one party system and and it's not communist it's not authoritarian but it is temporarily at the very least until you figure out a way to get rid of them and while they have power they have complete power the united states at least had this you know, we have a federal system where we have uh, you know divided states and um you know states uh, used to mean, you know, independent countries. I think when the United States of America happened, people don't realize it was the United States of America. And there were individual states just like Belgium and France. And, you know, they had and they were grouped together for external things like, you know, protection, and whatnot. So in the U U.S., we actually had, you know, a little bit of this federal system at work where there's competition between states. North Dakota and South Dakota did different things. You know, New, New York and Florida did different things. And you can kind of have these things, these ideas compete and bubble up and get, you know, to our friend uh, Paul Freider's uh, concept. You know, the, the kumbaya of this one world government that tends to be from the left from socialist concept does not work because you get rid of the competition of, of ideas and you, you wind up you know, necessarily with corruption because, you know, more power, more corruption, less, you know, you don't get the ideas bubbling up. You don't get them filtered up. And so what we saw, you know, through a lot of these, uh, you know, uniparty uh, parliamentary states was was horrible draconian measures. You know, like you're mentioning, like, you know, police choking people and, you know, keeping people out of parks and what Australia, you know, we always think is a, you know, sweet and little nice place with kangaroos and whatnot and very pleasant, civil <laughs> place and, you know, no crime and all this kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, the crime was there, but it was from the state on the people. Anyway, I, I'm sorry, sorry again for, for you know, stepping on your, your show here. No, 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 no. This is absolutely fine. So what you've actually raised are uh, parts of the work that I'm looking at. So in my own book itself, I had looked at some of the failures and the options within the parliamentary system to fix it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they, and, uh, and, and I was, uh, I've got some suggestions there. And by the way, Paul Fridges has a number of suggestions as well in the work that he's written along with Gigi Foster and others in their book, The Great COVID Panic, et cetera. So there's a lot of thinking going on among it. See, the, 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 the thing about economies, we, we always look at systems, right? And if you look at Buchanan's work, uh, uh, he's looked at, uh, you know, so we look at how, why democracies fail. We look at why uh, people, why, why governments are always corrupt. Uh, these are the kind of things that uh, really are of interest. And that is definitely part of my review, what you've just said. Uh, it, it will be part of my work. Uh, the other point, I just wanted to, flag for those who didn't really know about it, because I, I discovered it only a few years ago, uh, the Japanese train was a very good example. Uh, are you aware that in the 1960s, it was still in the government hands? Yes. And it was not distinguishable between the kind of uh, trains that you get in India, um, which are really dirty and filthy. <laughs> so, they, and they were always late as well. So uh, let me explain. So they, 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 when you said you're not yet bought into my argument of public health existence, uh, I, I hope to persuade you by the end non, of the Non-existence. Yeah, uh, the question. So the, the idea that uh, public health, in my view, has no role. So it's got no role. What they've also done now, by the way, if you might have uh, been aware of, They've been busy trying to tell us what is good for our health. And they've been giving us these guidelines and so on. You know, they're encroaching into our thing. Fat is good or not good or whatever. Look, that's a that's a matter for me to decide. I don't need you. I don't need anybody to tell me that. So public health is doing things which has no business to do in the first place. So it's actually just trying to grow and grow. And they also have included social justice. 
as part of their work. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, public health, uh, public health university websites and literature on social justice. Uh, BLM is part of their work, apparently. Uh, and then we have uh, climate change. So they've also added climate change. I mean, there's nothing in the world that they can't include as part of our so-called health, right. right? So I don't think we need any of that. So my point is, none of that. Shut it down. Let them go home and lock up all the Fauci's in the world, you know, uh, punish them, et cetera, if possible. But at you, least shut down you, this, you shut you down wanna, this you, damn thing. Right. You want to lock down Dr. Fauci. Absolutely. I want to lock down a lot of other people as well. But leaving that aside, uh, which is probably not possible, as for, Paul would tell me, because we've had chats about this, you know, he says no, no accountability. Nothing is never been a case, an example in history, apart from the Nuremberg trials, which also, by the way, only touched about 0.0001% of the actual uh, criminals. So le leaving aside the accountability part, which is almost impossible, uh, let's go to the fundamental and say, why do we need public health? So that's my question. And I'm, I'm inviting anybody, you know, who has an interest in this to, to right. write to me about their thoughts. And let's, uh, you know, take it from there. Yeah, no, I'd like, I'd like that. Um, you, you left me with a couple pages I'm going to show people um, just so they can uh, get a concept here. And obviously, they'll have to go to the links themselves. So this is, um, uh, this is PH, and it's sublock.city.com, or excuse me, sublock city, one word. Um, and you'll, you know, have to check this out. Um, and yeah, I don't think you pull any punches. I mean, no, um, I don't. I, don't. I, I don't think that's punches. a really fascinating thing. I'm not going to be able to, you know, go over the whole article here. Um, there are two but, books actually, about a hundred thousand yeah. words already. Yep. Yeah. Um, and this is um, a little bit of your public health review. I guess the PH starts stands for public health in, yes. in the title. Yes. Um, and and we can. I, I'm not sure we're going to be able to go through all of these, but I think they're provocative. Um, uh, and so this is a better, better look here. Um, and I'm getting, you know, people can pause this if they want and, you know, take a look at it and, uh, but I'm not going to do that right now. Um, uh, do you want to go through any of those and, and discuss them individually or leave them out there or, or move on? Uh, it's a, it's a, it's an incomplete list and I've been updating that list every day, every day, practically. So people who are interested, they can download my books. Uh, they get updated every day or so. Uh, I add, I keep adding new material. I've been researching the Nazi ethics, the precautionary principle, you know, the whole thing, basically the whole jing bang about why do we need public health and what exactly is this function? And, uh, uh and I'm finding that it can basically do nothing. Uh, well, it, it, I, I take that. I mean, I dispute that it can do actually grave harms. You know, the the, the yeah, Jews. So, so my 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 heritage is, uh, you know, East European Jewish. And, you know, I lost, uh, you know, members of our extended family um, in the Holocaust and the Nazis. And so forth. But that was a lot of it was a public health measure. Yes. Um, you know, Jews were uh, kind of demonized as vermin, um, you know, and and it was really you know the, the place was going to be judenfrei uh you know free of jews and the, the, a lot of the public health um aspects were analogized uh but we, we we are we as as humans i mean you know i i don't blame just the germans it's like i think that humans have this capability yeah. and we see this happening in different ways at different times um what what's happening oftentimes and again again in the name of public health like for instance if you wind up opposing uh, the castration, say the premature castration of your child, um, you know, which, which, you know, again, a public sphere, it's oftentimes in the public schools, we're finding out that these uh, concepts, which are, you know, they have a religious aspect to them that you're going to find your, your telos, your, your true purpose by, you know, castrating and neutering, neutering yourself, which is, you know, contrary to the, the way that animals got here in the first place, I don't think anybody came from anybody who was neutered or castrated. At least I, I think my parents were not castrated or neutered, at least by the time they had me. At any rate, this obviously inimical with the, the production and reproduction and continuation of life as humans. Uh, maybe the deer and the, the panthers we mentioned will still be here, um, but but we won't if we wind up castrating our kids. Anyway, any rate, if, if you disagree with that as a parent, public health can come in and take your child away from you mm -hmm. and deposit that child with somebody who will allow the the, the flowering as it were the, which is kind of interesting mm -hmm. is the you know flowers are sexual and you know so it, it, so I basically allow the non flowering of your child and and you you can lose in a lot of different ways and those all those things are in the name of public health it's amazing to me that 
you know, what is considered public health. You, you were speaking to morals and ethics. And so for the, these things, I, 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 you know, outside a very um, kind of, I guess, eternal um, uh, framework. I mean, I think the Roman Catholic Church, I'm not a Catholic, but I respect that they have written things out and they, they're, they this is what you do and don't, you don't do. And they've been against abortion. They say abortion taking of life. Well, fine. And, and so, you know, I think they would similarly come down with the fact that you cannot, um, you know, mutilate, castrate, uh, mastectomize uh, a 13 year old girl uh, or, or castrate a 12 year old boy um, and so forth. You know, people wind up doing things over the course of their lives as adults. I'm not really in favor of it as adults. I think it's malpractice, you know, to, to, to see that as an expedient. I think it's a, a weird kind of um, fetish, fetishization of the body to think that you can cure your your issues and problems by extracting or, or excising something or even adding something if i decide you know i'm not really smart enough i want an extra head on my shoulders or <laughs> you know I, I mean people have had these kind of you know superstitious aspects um and all well and good they're welcome to them i guess to a point but but you can't have the 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 the, the power of society coming down and, and, and doing these things when in fact, you know, mind you, the same public health said exactly the opposite merely like five years ago. Um, you know, if I had come up, you know, frankly, if, if Mengele, you know, Hitler's, uh, you know, infamous doctor from Auschwitz had, had thought of, you know, you know, castrating the kids and so forth, I, mean, I think they'd be like, you know what, like, we're killing them, but let's, that's a little extreme, <laughs> you know, just keep, it's like, you know, th these things are, are rather, you know, strange and grotesque. And, and, and everybody's on board, like everybody, all the whole medical establishment is on board with this. Like what, you know, did you, I mean, I went to medical school, nobody talked about this. And if people had issues, you know, which, which now you call gender dysphoria, like where was all that? I mean, maybe some people had it, but it's like, you know, they're talking now about like 20% of the kids in school in the US, you know, are considered themselves LGBT, et cetera, and so forth. Where did that come from? The numbers are enormous. And obviously it's, it's through the public establishment. And so, you know, you have to argue whether there is a public health, whether that's coincident, coordinated with public schools and public this and public that, and whether it is actually serving the public to whom they, they've attached their name, public, so the people. Mm. <laughs> you know, so now you've actually proven that you are on my side, actually. When I said public health, what does public health do? You actually said it only does harm, which is what I'm saying. The net harm of a particular discipline is what matters. And so it is actually not doing any benefit to anybody. The only benefit it does can be done through the private sector. And by the way, you're absolutely right about the schools. The idea of the government running schools is the most atrocious idea that I've come across. And I think when you look at uh, the work of James Tooley, and I have his book, here, I won't have time to share. Uh, you know, uh, it's called The Beautiful Tree, James Tooley. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. And I met him in London. He's a great, wonderful educator, and uh, he showed why private schools can do so much better. But apart from the fact that they can do better, they actually are representative of the people directly rather than a government body, which is then captured by self-interested people, like you said, the regulatory capture and so on, or by ideal, ideal, ideologues of some sort, like all the stuff that's going on, you know, with the castration and LBG, LBGT, whatever, you know, things. So the, the fact that you have public schooling is itself a fundamental problem. So we have had uh, Lord Macaulay, as my, in my view, as the person who started this whole exercise, uh, and therefore responsible for it. Uh, he was a great liberal, but he made a fundamental blunder. Uh, so these are the kind of things that I work on. And then I've, I've, I've been writing a hell of a lot on these issues in the past, and I continue to do that. Uh, but this is not a focus on education. My focus will be on making sure that I understand clearly the purpose of public health. What is it that uh, we need to do and what is it that we don't need to do? And so far, by the way, I've found that there is nothing that it needs to do except a quarantine. Yes, for Ebola, if you're getting Ebola, you got a symptom of Ebola, I need you to be, we all need, we all agree that's a good thing to put somebody in a quarantine. And that can be done by the police uh, and, and the doctor can be sent in to check on the person. Uh, but we don't need a, a department. Uh, we don't need a discipline. And we don't need anyone to tell us what's good for our health. That's the last right. thing we need to tell us, uh, you know, eat more, eat more of this or that. And in fact, the funny thing is now people are saying eat more fat, uh, and so, really, it's it's a, it's a very very peculiar change of you know um, ideas. And no, it's, from that it's amazing. Part of my book, um, uh, you know, I looked at exactly what you're saying, and there, there's the egg. I mean, you know, Ed, mind egg. you, you mentioned climate stuff. You know, there was global cooling, then global warming, then 
global, uh, whatever, I think, I forget which started, but they've been back and forth and back and forth. And then they came up with this kind of non-term climate change, which is, I mean, everything changes. <laughs> everything changes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I was, I, I, one of my slides in the book or pictures is uh, of, of the egg. And, and it's, is it, you know, is the egg good or bad? Uh, these things are very faddish. You know, the eggs were great. Uh, when I was growing up, they, they wanted to put an egg in everything. I was in um, sleepaway camp and apparently they thought I was too skinny, uh, whatever that is. And again, I think they were wrong about that in retrospect, because I mean, what does too skinny mean? I, I was living and breathing. I was running. I was, I was fast. I, you know, I was a good track runner and I obviously lived. <laughs> and, but they, you know, drop an egg is that fatten you up. Um, and then then so the eggs are healthful and then they are bad and then they're good again. And, and people are like, oh, they bring high cholesterol. They don't. Whatever. You know, these things are not all well proven. And even if they were, you know, a lot of what passes for public health and public health instruction within the schools is inimical to to the quality of life oftentimes. I, I bring this up. May, may I may I yeah. uh, trouble you with one quick yeah. story? No, please, please go ahead. All right. So I was at a function. This is like, you know, the before times, you know, before COVID, we had cocktail parties and stuff. This is a business thing at, in Cambridge. And, it, you know, it was a regular thing. Anyway, there were a hundred people there, whatever. And I, I'm watching this guy. And there was there was food <laughs> and people have, you know, no mask, crazy. And um, he was staring at like a little steak on a like a satay or, you know, teriyaki steak on a stick. And he's just kind of like looking at it like a dog outside the window of the bakery. And and I'm like, and he's about my age. I said, you know, and I kind of looked over at him. I look at the steak and I say, I grab one. I said, you know, the amount of time you spend looking at that, wishing for it and being miserable over it. Now, let's say there's two possibilities. One is you eat it and one is you walk away. OK, if you eat it. You will. Probably, ha ha if you had come immediately to eat it, you would have spared yourself the three minutes you stood here. St and, and mind you, maybe you're going to lose three minutes of life at the end. Maybe not. But at least you will have had the pleasure of, of, of you know, being yourself, acting on your desires, and having the pleasure. And I got to tell you, I'm eating the thing. It's delicious. <laughs> In case you know, <laughs> you know. At any rate, you know, I, I, I so he kind of he ate. He was like very much relieved. And I said, you know, I'm only a doctor. I mean, I, I don't think you should eat steak. You know. 18 times a day, whatever. But, you know, people people need pleasure to, to, to understand, kind of, you know, give themselves rewards and whatnot. But but as far as dietary advice and all that kind of stuff, they spend so much time in the schools on the margins of the food pyramid and it changes over time and this and that. And, and the real determinants of longevity are actually things that have much more to do with your soul. And I know that's not a medical term, but the, the, when, when you are cohesive, whether you, when you are, you know, married and love, um, active in your community, helping people and all that kind of stuff. People live longer. Now, why is that? Well, they probably drink less. They probably have less need for, you know, going out and hunting down drugs and whatnot. You know, when you make people miserable, the biggest thing about this lockdown stuff is they made people miserable. And whatever you saved in saving the elderly, again, which I like to save, we kept my mother-in-law in our basement for a decade and she went all through COVID, all that kind of stuff. I love saving my old people, but, you know, but it was inimical to, to the essence of life. And, and, and what they saw as a result was an, a huge increase in the number of, of deaths of despair, I mean, alcoholism, yeah. uh, heroin, fentanyl, all these kinds of overdoses. And those total, those took grab young people, uh, you know, the young people let themselves be grabbed, you know, I'm not un, un, unfaulty or defaulting them, but you know, the, the misery applied was horrible. I, I was just with a friend, um, at the uh, RFK Jr. Uh, announcement speech today, and it's Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Um, and uh, he has young children. Um, they're less than 10 years old. And through COVID, uh, one of them, uh, they were in the house endlessly, endlessly, no friends, no play, nothing, They, you know, no playgrounds. And the younger one was only like six or seven at the time, wanted to kill himself. You know, th this is a horrible, grave thing. We don't know what that's going to, you know, how that's going to play out as, as an imprint or a tattoo on his, his brain function. You know, we, we need, our childhoods are longer proportionally than any other mammal our size. So we have a really long, you know, whether you want to call it 13 or 15 or 18, whatever the number is based on society at the time, we have an enormous childhood. And that's so we can play and learn we learn by play, by activity and so forth. And that was all excised, you know, a couple of years out of, out of children's lives. We have not seen the ramifications of that yet, yeah. but I just can't imagine they'd be good. 
Um, and this this was again public health. Public so, health. So there you are. You actually are completely on my side. In fact, you have given me more fodder for my book. <laughs> <laughs> you got to make me so co-author. Then. I think we. Uh, yeah, I, I've invited everybody to be a co-author. The way it would work is people would actually write articles and and separate pieces for the book. I would be doing my own little work, whatever. But people would have the slots inside the thing because this is going to be free of cost in perpetuity. My intention is that hopefully somebody someday might read it, you know, at the end of it, once I finish it or others can contribute and people can keep contributing. So it's a totally open project. It's designed to fix the entire problem. Public health has been the greatest enemy of public health. So that, I think what you just said is more uh, making things more clear. But they have absolutely no regard for all these little subtle details about what life is all about. And they, they impose their views the moment they form a view that egg is good or bad or whatever. Everybody must do exactly what they think. And I think that's left nothing short of totalitarianism. We right. do not need totalitarian people telling us what to do. The first thing I have is I ask, why did I resign? Because I'm fighting the health officer of the state who said, wear a mask outdoors. It made me really angry. I don't do things just because you want me to do. I do things because I want to do them. And I think everybody needs to understand and then do things. And that's the kind of thing they don't want us to do have. They don't want us to have agency, our own individual uh, individual thinking capacity or anything of the sort. I don't think they do any good for the world at all. So public health must go. <laughs> right. Well, you know, it, it, it's, it's going to be replaced by something else. So we have to have a system where people have their rights and liberties and so forth. And that can, can, you know gets back to our, my earlier point about some of the fault lines uh, that we saw in the parliamentary system. Um, we're rounding out the hour now. And you've been very generous with your time, and I, I made you wait earlier, so I apologize. Um, so, what what was what's what's your call to action? I'm going to put up your Twitter feed, I believe, um, and uh, uh, people can find you there, and they can you know make some links. The real key is spend, spelling your name correctly. Um, <laughs> you probably don't have yes. any trouble doing it, but other people might. <laughs> other people um, will. <laughs> so I'm going to make it bigger there, um, and uh, you've made the mistake of following me on Twitter. Um, and Tom. I'm just joking, um, but I very much uh, enjoyed the time um, with you. So I'm going to give you a chance to uh, kind of round things out, um, and I'm going to have you do a final word. Then I'm going to do a final, final word after that. Great. Uh, look, um, all my life since I've become more or less uh, aware of things when I was around 12 years old, and I still have the book with me, which woke me up, which is a book on philosophy. Actually, it's a book on the uh, uh, it covered a lot of philosophers uh, all over the world and what their views were. I came to know about Socrates. I came to know about Voltaire and everybody. And since then, I've been really opening my mind to all these things. And so I've come to the view long time ago, we need liberty. Everybody must be free to make mistakes. We What's need the name to... Of the, book? Uh, the book is sitting here, the one. Uh, I, I'll send you the thing. It's somewhere here. I, I forget the name of the book. It's a very old book on the... you know. Comp it's not uh, Heilbrunner's uh, book. Uh, it's another book by uh, somebody. I forget it now. But the point okay. is that there, the, the general point was that since the age of 12, I've been reading widely. And my, uh, my request, and so my, my belief is in critical thinking, uh, liberty, and individualism. These are my you know, pillars uh, on which I, I live. And I do not like to be bullied by anybody. I would hope that people listening would also be of the same view, uh, that don't get bullied by anyone. Ask questions. So you know, keep demanding proofs. And if something doesn't work for you, you know, just fight back. Um, right. So I, I appreciate that. So um, people can find you on Twitter and they can contact you. Uh, they can share this widely. I, I just wanted to put up, uh, you made me think um, on this same topic. Uh, one, of, one of the books that opened my eyes, I think he just passed, is by Paul Johnson. And I actually had a, a tenant years ago by the same name. We didn't get along. Uh, so when I saw the book, I was a little, you know, oh, Paul, at any rate, um, common name, I guess. But this is an amazing book, Modern Times. And he opened my eyes to um, many aspects of the way the world has worked. Uh, it's a very comprehensive, he's an excellent historian. Um, I think he started out on the left, uh, wound up on the right. He's got a history of the American people. He's got a great, great book called Intellectuals, um, I believe. Um, and I'm going to have, uh, soon I'm going to have on one of um, another writer of that type, Daniel Flynn, who wrote another book on the history of intellectuals. Um, but these are, when you actually 
there we go. Paul John's an intellectual, so I'm sorry to do this on the fly, but you made me think of it. Um, and this is an, this is a, an incredible book. I mean, this is probably an easier, more accessible book than um, than the, the modern yeah. times, which is bigger. But in almost every instance, the um, I'll call them perpetrators, the intellectuals, um, are guilty of of the things they are are railing against. Uh, people, basically, it's hypocrisy. Um, so you know, Karl Marx, Marx is a rotten person; doesn't care about anybody. Abandons his kids and so forth. I'm not going to get all the facts right, but you know, all the things they espouse basically are for other people, not for themselves. And I'm I'm thinking uh, there's a great picture. I, I probably can't get it up in time, of um, of Saint Anthony of Fauci at a baseball game um, in the summer yeah. of 2020. Everyone running. else has to be masked, and he's out there. He's the only person in the stadium with his wife and a friend and uh he's got his fingers in this pose here and he's not wearing a mask now uh, you can imagine the power to have a baseball game which is cricket in your terms but you know a baseball game usually if opening day would have seventy thousand people in this thing and they'd be raucous and they're outdoors <laughs> there let me remind people they're outdoors and nobody was there fauci threw the first pitch out which is laughable because you know he's an older guy mm -hmm. i don't blame him but but then to be in the stands completely by yourself and tell everyone else in the country to wear a mask all, all times, and he's got his down by his by his, his chin. You know, he said he was drinking water. It's not not even true. But anyway, this is a great book um, by Paul Johnson, Intellectuals, and I'm going to sh show people another great book, um, which they have to buy. Uh, I've been telling people they don't they don't have to read it, but they do have to buy it. If you want to support uh, this podcast and the work I do here, um, please buy. Um, overturning Zika, the pandemic that never was. Um, and I have some shorter versions, I guess, uh, um, that are up on the American Journal of Medicine and whatnot. But you, sh you should buy this book, um, Overturning Zika. And, uh, you know, if you like it, review it. If you don't like it, uh, you can review it as long as you give a good, you know, a good review. <laughs> but but it, it was a fascinating topic where public health uh, did public health stuff, but they've kind of lost the thread. They have not retracted, they've not reformulated, they've not gone back. On, on what happened, you know, Zika microcephaly, Zika is a real thing. It's a real virus, it's a dengue-like virus, and microcephaly is a real thing. It just doesn't happen that one caused the other. Zika is almost the same as dengue. I, I give people this little prop. There, there are four, uh, four dengues, and Zika is kind of like this little one. See him over here, and now you see him, now you don't. So it never caused a single human illness in, in, in forever, and it probably still doesn't. But they, they, they sort of maybe found it, maybe it was dengue, maybe it was Zika, whatever. But, and then somewhere else in, in Brazil, they thought there was more microcephaly. It's so rare that it's instead of like seeing one four-leaf clover, which is rare, in a huge field, they maybe saw two or three four-leaf clovers. Now, does that mean that, that four-leaf clovers are taking over the world? Does, is it, anyway, it's, when you have rare things, mathematically, it's very hard to prove causality. And, and the fact of the matter is every year since, in every place on Earth since Brazil, including Northeast Brazil, there's been no microcephaly increase in the, even in the places where they found – uh, Zika. So if, if you want to coordinate with me on an article for the Times of uh, India in Rajasthan in 2018, they were on the hunt. They, they found Zika. They were waiting and waiting to see the burst. They, they were very careful. They taught everyone how to what the measurements were, what the standards were. They didn't find anything. Now, that, if I were the Fauci or the, uh, I can't remember the guy, the WHO, the Ethiopian guy, um, Tedros, I would say, you know, Tedros. I, 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 Tedros, uh, Anyway, Something. I would say, you know what, we're going to give this one a break. You know, we tried. We, we're looking out for your interest, but I think we went over the, the line and we're that honest. You know, we're going to tell you when we're wrong. So you understand that when we tell you the next time that we're right because we are always, you know, anyway, they didn't do any of that. And still as an industry, there's going to be a vaccine just around the corner. And okay. I, I would I don't want to make a bet with you because you're going to lose that they're going to monetize Zika and then they're going to declare that they got rid of it. And this is a billion dollar industry because it's, you know, three and a half billion people in the tropics and Zika potentially anywhere else. So mm -hmm. I'm going to leave it there. Uh, so if you want to support me, my work, uh, buy my book, you can go check out uh, Sanjeev Sablok. And um, uh, you and I can hang out to chat, but we're going to say goodbye to everybody else.